we remain standing this morning for the reading of the Word. It comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived in Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor, and Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, that she poured it, it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of, the, of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise Thanks, be, Thanks to God. be to God. Amen. You can be seated. When I first came into the ministry, uh, many, many, many moons ago, getting a little longer, isn't it, fam? Uh, when I think about those days and uh, think about some characters in my life that were were very precious to me, they were they're very, very interesting people to say the least. Uh, but I came to love them in a great way. One of the guys would, it was an, an older gentleman, he would always, every time he'd see me into town, he would ask me, well, what you going to preach about Sunday, preacher? And, you know, I had not a clue. I mean, this, this might have been Monday or Tuesday. Uh, you know, I was just trying to keep my head above water. Uh, I've learned to, uh, to really discipline myself to get things done in a different way today. But back then, I just was flying by the seat of my pants just trying to keep people from killing me. Uh, you know, not to mess things up, if you will. But I remember he would always do that, and it would irritate me. It would just irritate me because I didn't want to talk to him about what I'm, what I'm planning to preach on on Sunday. But he always persisted, and, and he probably really just didn't care. But he would always ask me that. And so I finally came up with a good answer. And I thought, man, this is the perfect answer. He can't argue with me what, in any way when I tell him this. He would ask me, holler across the, uh, the grocery store or something, Preacher, what you preaching about Sunday? And I'd holler right back at him, Sin! <laughs> and I'd expect him to hush up, you know, and go on about his grocery business. But no, he came right back at me, Well, are you fair it or are you again it? And, uh, and sometimes I just have to ask myself, well, well what time is it? No. Uh, but that was a, a great way of, of um, just picking at each other, I guess. And, but sometimes you have to ask yourself that question. Are you for it or are you against it? Now, I don't usually talk like that. That's not my slang to, to use those words. But you, you know those people. You know people that, uh, that are against everything. And we see ourselves here when Jesus is, um, when he's gone to Bethany. Great things had happened in Bethany. Now let's not deny it. We saw that just a couple of weeks before this party uh, that has Lazarus reclining at the table, the word says, means that, that a couple of weeks before he had died. He had died and the sisters had called for him to come and, and that was his, their beloved brother. And you, you think about Cece this morning and the, the raw emotions that, that she's feeling uh, to lose her brother and to have another brother that, that is, is, is sick and, and in such need of healing. And so you know how much that those sisters loved their brother. And so they called upon Jesus, but Jesus was in the midst of a lot of things going on. People were pressing in upon him. People were, were uh, calling on him, warning him at all times. Now I remember uh, back when 
uh, I was the disaster recovery coordinator for, the, uh, for Walker County after tornadoes that happened in Carbon Hill when I was serving at Carbon Hill United Methodist Church. Now think about how that, uh, that was a day when uh, cell phones had just come into vogue. Uh, people had, uh, had started getting cell phones and, and so I was using my cell phone uh, to do any kind of church business. That's what I put on my card. If you needed me, you'd call me. I wanted to be in contact with people. I wanted to, uh, to be, have people to be able to contact me anytime they needed me in an emergency. So they could never say that Brother Michael was not available. Because I put myself, and do that even to this day, uh, I never turn my, my cell phone off uh, it, unless it has to reboot itself for some reason. Uh, I just don't do it. I, I keep it there, and, and sometimes it's the most horrific thing in the world to hear that phone go off at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning because we know it's not going to be anything good. But as I was thinking about those days after the tornadoes, people were calling me all hours, day and night. I was getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning, and I was going on and through until dark every day. And we were working on houses and people were calling because they were desperate, desperate people. They wanted, they wanted to, to get a roof uh, repaired or they wanted uh, to, to re, reframe up a bedroom that they had lost. Or, or maybe they were needing to, uh, to do something else uh, to help get their water on or their power back on. Whatever it was, they were desperate and they needed help. So they'd call me. And... I think about uh, how it was to, to be pressed in upon and people warning you day and night. And then I think about Jesus and how that he had to have been overwhelmed because he had just started his ministry in the, in the most powerful ways when he was healing. He was healing people. And, I, and if you were uh, part of, of that group then, of the early church, if you were part of that uh, when Jesus was healing... I mean, that was something to behold, to see somebody that all their life had been crippled and, and now they were, they were straightened. You see people that were cut off from God. They couldn't go into the, into the temple because they had a, an issue with blood. And to see them restored and going and to show themselves to the priest and clean. And they were able to go in, in back into the, uh, to the sanctuary, into the, uh, to the area of worship in the temple. This meant everything to them. Everything. To see people who were starving and hungry and Jesus fed them. So you can imagine that word was getting out and people were getting excited. And so they were talking about it. And that's the greatest thing that can happen in a church is when people get excited about what God is doing. And if you can get excited about what God is doing and you begin to share it with people, it builds. It builds in such a way that it's even more powerful. It becomes a weapon, if you will. It becomes a, a sword. It becomes a mighty sword that can slay the things of the world that try to harm you and try to destroy you. It becomes your greatest ally. You can depend upon it. You can count on it. And you begin to grow that spirit in such a way that you are for it with every, every part of your body, every part of your spirit and your soul begins to cry out to God because you get to that point where everything you're focusing on is God. And hallelujah, that is wonderful. When you can focus everything in your life centers around God. And why shouldn't it? He created the heavens and the earth. He created everything. He gave you your jobs. He gave you your families. He's given you everything. He, he's at work day and night. He never slumbers. He never sleeps. He is with you. He comforts you. He encourages you. And why shouldn't your life be focused around that? And if you can focus your life around that, the disciples, they could focus every day. What is it we're going to see today, God? What is it we're going to be a part of today? We're ready. We're no longer fishermen. We're no longer in the stench of, of the fish. And we're no longer tanners. We're no longer having to, to deal with the things that make us impure and that people uh, scour us about, people who put us down. Instead, now, we're part of the glory of God. And it's exciting. And we want to get up and we want to go and we want to do and be part of this today. Now, if you can hear those words come from your mouths, don't you know people can get excited about it? 
Don't you know that people can get excited and, and, and they can no longer have to think about the darkness in their lives, no longer have to think about, about what might happen and, and how it all can fall apart and how the marriages can, can end and how that people can, uh, can be hateful and, and how that we can be put down and pushed down and beaten down. Instead, now, if you're, everything that you have is focused around God, if everything that you have is, is about the purpose of God, then you know that victory is yours. You know that victory is there for you. And we know that, that if you're with Christ and you're walking with Christ and then you're excited, then you can be part of the great things that are about to happen. And that's what was happening with Jesus and the disciples. But Jesus became tired. And He had to kind of go away, remember? Remember, He, he, he went away to, to try to get some rest. And there were many times, many times. See, see, you forget that that God uh, that came from heaven and the, had the, the the skin of humanity stretched upon Him, and we call Him Jesus. And if you forget that Jesus is fully human and fully divine, He understands our sufferings. He understands that we get tired. He understands that that we can be beaten down. He understands that that we can get to the point where we just want to go away. As He asked the disciples, do you want to go away? Do you want to go away? And they finally, when they had been in His presence for a while, when they had, had, had worshipped Him and, and they had seen the victory, they finally looked at Him and said, Lord, where could we go? Where could we go? And I think of all these things that are happening and now, uh, now the sisters are calling upon Jesus. Come, Jesus, come, Jesus. And that's just one word. Uh, one, one fragment of the, of the people around Him is calling for Him to come. To come so that he could, uh, so he could bring Lazarus from his slumber, from his sleep. Now think about how it must have felt when Jesus came. Some of you understand that right now. Some of you, it is clear to you that Jesus chose not to come right now. And I can't imagine how that feels to you. But I promise you, Jesus has not abandoned you. Jesus has not abandoned you. He will, he will not forsake you. Sometimes things have to happen we, we can't understand it. There's just some things that we're not going to be able to explain. We're not going to be able. We just have to trust in God. We have to trust in that God that we see heal. We have to trust in that God that's made things right. And I know that God will make things right in your life once again. And then there's heaven. There's heaven to look forward to and, that, and there's everlasting life. And all those things, God will bring glory. God will bring glory and He will come to a great crescendo of His love. His love was poured out on the cross at Calvary for us. But it was not complete. That was not His complete love. His love will not be complete until He comes back for His bride. His love will not be complete until He comes back and He takes us back to the place that He has prepared. And He will go and He will prepare that place and He will come again and take us to that place. And there will be no more hurt. There will be no more death. There will be no more cancer. There will be more, no more uh, people that put you down, that discriminate against you, that wound you and afflict you. So we see that Jesus tarried. But He did come. He did come. And it was there that even when the sisters thought that nothing could be done, they had already given up on Lazarus. You see, that's just like Jesus. That's just like Jesus to, to see that the circumstances are absolutely to the point where nobody could say anything other than this is a miracle. You see, that's, that's how God is, is, is today. God takes us in our brokenness. He takes us in our in our loneliness. He takes us in our, our defeat and He makes it right again. He makes it right again. He makes it, he makes it a miracle so that we can then get excited again. 
So we see that Jesus went, and he went there, and he, he called forth for Lazarus to come forth, and he did, and he lived. And now he's sitting at the table with him. And this is supposed to be a great night. It's a great night. Just weeks ago, he had come by, and he was at the, uh, the home in Bethany, had wonderful conversations with Mary. And there, he many things had happened there in Bethany. Wonderful things had happened there in Bethany. So why would this not be another moment when something great is going to happen in Bethany? We see that something wonderful is happening at Bethany. We see that the here that Mary had been collecting everything that she had. Everything that she had. The only thing that she had a talent for was going out and, and taking the botanicals, the, uh, the nectar, if you will, of the floral uh, things around her. And she was able to, to get the oils from it in such a way. And she put it with the, the fat of the olives. They call that a nard. And that she would put that in there so that then it would be, be like a salve of healing. And that's what she wanted to do. She wanted to take her salve of healing and she wanted to wipe out the stench that was going on at that party that night. You see, they'd already started grumbling about what Jesus was about to do. They didn't like it. We see that the disciples weren't for that. See, they wanted a king. They'd prayed for a king and they'd wanted a king and they thought they were getting a king. But what they didn't understand that they were getting everything that they wanted and it was the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But they wanted a mighty king like David to fight their battles of the flesh. But instead, Jesus was the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And He was going to fight, he was going to fight a spiritual battle. A battle that would, would destroy so many more than the flesh and the sword. He was coming to save us. He was coming to save us. And it was a spiritual battle that goes on today. And we need Jesus more today than we've ever needed Him before in our lives. We need Him right now doing battle for us. We need Him now being our King. We need Him to direct us. We need Him to guide us. We need Him to lead us. But there's always those around the table that start stinking. You know, when they came, when He came and uh, was coming forth for Lazarus. They said, "Don't, no, 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 Lord, don't, don't go into the tomb. Don't go near the tomb, for he's stinking." That's what they said. They didn't want him, their their beloved Jesus. They didn't want him to go and have to smell that smell. They knew what death was. They understood death, and they knew it intimately. And now this woman, Mary, Mary, who everything she had. This was a year's wages. A year's wages. Can you imagine? How many of us would, would take a year's of our wage, wages right now and say, here God, you take it and do what you want to with it. I know that you have given me everything. I know that you are my Lord. And that if everything else fails me in this world, I know that you won't. How many of us are willing to do that? Can I, can I back it down to six months? Are you willing to give six months? What about, what about six weeks? What about a month? Am I, am I, am I getting anyone yet? Are, are you willing to give six hours of your wages? People, God is with us. Jesus was with the disciples. Jesus had a plan. And he was turning his face to Jerusalem. And he was about to come in triumphantly on a donkey. He was not coming in on a white horse. One day he will come back on a white horse. One day he will come back wielding a sword. One day he will come with all the wrath and the might of God Almighty. He's going to come back and the trumpets are going to sound. And the people are going to, the dead are going to rise. And, and we're going to see victory. We're going to see victory in a way we've never seen victory before. There will be no defeat. There will be no sorrow. There'll be nothing but joy from the people of God who stand up and shout and praise His holy name. And those that do will be given everlasting life. Those that do will experience the fullness of God's love that only began at the cross at Calvary. I think about how the, the stink started that night when they started grumbling about Mary breaking open that alabaster jar and pouring out that nard upon Jesus. You see, she was willing to be part of His ministry. 
in a way that no one else could because she was accepting that he was going to die. That he was going to die for our sins. That he was going to die. That he was going to do exactly what he had begun saying that he was going to do. That he was going to die. He was going to suffer and die. And then he was going to, uh, going to be put into a tomb. And then after the third day, he would be risen up. She understood that. And the one thing that she wanted for Jesus to be done while he was still alive was to anoint him for his burial. For anoint him with that precious oil. To anoint her with that fragrance that filled the room and overpowered the stink of the, the hearts of the disciples that wouldn't follow him fully, that would betray him, that would turn against him, that would deny him. All of the stink that was in that room that night, something special did happen. It did happen because the jar was broken and he was uh, bathed with that precious anointing for his death. But see, the againers were there. Remember where I started? You can either infer it or you're going to be again it. You know againers. You know againers right here in our church. You know them in our community. You know them in, our, in politics. You know them in the world around you. They're the people that are always against something. If you say that you're for something, they're always going to find a way to be against it. All right? It starts off uh, in a way that sometimes is just, well, you just don't know everything. So I'm going I'm to clue you in on why that you shouldn't have your way. Why you shouldn't get excited about victory in your life. I'm going to show you that uh, I know more than you do. And it becomes intoxicated. You see, Jesus was about the new wine and the new wine skin. And Jesus was trying to get the disciples to, to develop new wineskins for their life. Instead of taking the old wine that they had been celebrating with, instead of taking the old wine that uh, had done them well, now, now they were taking this new wine and they didn't really know what to do with it. They put it in old wineskins and it became tainted and it wasn't good. Jesus was giving them new wineskins so that if they put the new wine in the new wineskins, then it is wonderful. But there are always going to be some that are against even that which is good and glorious and powerful. And they start off and they become intoxicated not on the new wine, but they become intoxicated on themselves, on their own power. And so they're against everything. And it's ten times more powerful than those that are fur. Those that are four things. That's why, people, it's so important for us today to be encouraging to our fellow Christians. Because you need to encourage them ten times for every time that you share with them something negative. And those who find themselves the againers, they become intoxicated by this power. They become intoxicated by the power and they find themselves very easily against everything. And, and before long, you never see them for anything. And that's what happens in the kingdom of God, in the power of God. We see that those that are for it, and they're, they're desperate, and they were, they're seeking to see something miraculous happen. That they surround themselves around Jesus. But then there are those that, that are on the fringes there that think that they're so powerful that they're supposed to stop anything that's happening because they don't want anybody to have any power but them. So there again, it over and over and over. And you show me somebody that's against things. You show me people that constantly are against whatever God might be doing. And you'll probably never see anything that they're for. So how is God going to use them? How can God use us if we're just against everything? We need to examine our own hearts. And ask ourselves, are you for it or are you again? I ask you today, are you for Jesus? Are you for the precious Savior, Jesus Christ? Are you for His kingdom? Are you for what He can do? Will you be part of the, of the power of the Holy Spirit? Will you wield a sword of truth? Will you wield a sword of encouragement? Will you take upon yourself and champion 
that which God is a part of and doing in our lives right now. Great victory will be won when our hearts are encouraged. Great victory will be won when we are willing to testify to what can happen when we walk in faith with our Savior.